um, that is actionable, sustainable, and builds on existing strengths of this region. Um, I would like to introduce our board member and our moderator for this evening, Scott Thompson. Thanks, Hillary, and uh, thanks to everyone here for attending tonight. Um, again, my name is Scott Johnson. I'll be moderating this evening. Hopefully, you won't hear or see too much from me. Uh, but I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited about renewable energy, especially in North Carolina. I think, depending on who you talk to, um, renewable energy in North Carolina has been described as a thriving success to a hot mess. So, what we're going to do tonight is really separate um, the fact from fiction and provide a lot of clear data and exactly where uh, renewable energy is going in the state. Uh, before we do that, I want to show a quick video, if you'll allow me to indulge myself, on uh, where we've been, in particular, with one renewable resource. that's um, prominent in the state now, so. I think it was uh, always misunderstood. People just didn't seem to like me. I think I annoyed them. I got on their nerves. I don't know why. That's just the way it was. So that said, a little bit of just quick um, rules of the road. Um, if you 
could silence our cell phones, that would be great, obviously, appreciate it. Um, and lastly, there are some handouts on the, uh, the chairs. Feel free to take notes on those, or if you're great at mental notes, do that as well. Um, but we're going to save the Q&A and discussion portion until the end after the presenters are through, um, just for, for time purposes. Other than that, I'll try to keep everything on schedule and we'll get things moving. So, Steve, I will load up your presentation.
We don't produce coal in North Carolina anymore. We haven't in probably 60 years. Uh, natural gas, uh, that may be changing soon, but we don't produce any natural gas in North Carolina. No crude oil. No biofuels, and this is, when they talk about biofuels, they're primarily talking about ethanol. So that may change soon too, but right now we don't do much of that. What we have is nuclear electric power and other renewable energy. That's what we produce here. Now this other renewable energy is interesting. This is the 2013 number. If you go back to 2012, this bar was about there. We've seen a pretty sizable jump in the amount of renewable energy being produced in the state. And I'll tell you that if you look at these numbers for 2014 and so far in 2015, that trend has continued pretty aggressively. So do we have other opportunities? Well, we talked briefly. We've got this discussion about natural gas. These are some of the areas in the middle of the state where we might be able to do some fracking at some point and get some natural gas production in the state. There is a conversation about offshore oil drilling going on uh, that might allow oil drilling to happen off the coast of North Carolina. Both of these conversations are pretty far out, and they're even farther out when gas prices and oil prices are as low as they are right now. So this is not going to happen anytime soon if it happens. So what that leaves us with to focus on in North Carolina to grow our energy supply is renewables. And we have actually a very well-balanced and uh, diverse set of renewable resources to work with here in North Carolina. Hydropower. Um, it's a significant amount of electricity. It's about 3% of the electricity generated in the state. The problem is that we don't have a lot of room to grow this. Uh, if you look, most of the major facilities, each of these represents a hydropower facility that produces electricity. Um, most of the reasonable facilities to tap are already tapped. They're mostly in the western part of the state, in the mountains. And the big problem is if you try and do new ones, um, you get into this whole discussion about the environmental damage that you're going to do the ecosystem around it. So siting a hydro facility these days is a lot tougher than it was in the 50s. Um, there may be people that say that's a good thing, and there will be people that look at climate change and say that's a bad thing. You know, we can take a little bit of local environmental damage if it helps us fight off climate change that might wreck the whole planet. Uh, you know, each person to their own personal beliefs on the environment should associate with hydro. Biomass is a little bit of a different discussion. We have a vast amount of biomass. If you look at this U.S. map, you can kind of get a sense as to where the biomass resources are. And North Carolina shows up as one of the leading states in terms of uh, resource potential. Now, when we say solid resources in biomass, we're primarily talking about crop residues, forest residues, mill residues, and urban woodwinds. So this is all wood-related stuff. This is not going out and taking down um, you know, old growth trees. This is resources that are pretty much designed as forestry resources that are supposed to be managed anyway. And it is a resource that is significant in North Carolina, which is why we're starting to see a lot of discussion about the pellet industry and exporting these wood pellets to Europe. So wood pellets are right now as a fuel source a little bit more expensive than the conventional resources we have in North Carolina. And so we're not seeing a lot of use of this in North Carolina. But there is a strong demand in Europe right now to switch out of coal and fossil resources and into biomass. And so we're seeing a massive sucking sound coming from, at least you're hearing a massive sucking sound, coming from Europe, trying to pull biomass resources from this country and from other countries and bring those resources to Europe to displace fossil. Uh, there's a whole PhD dissertation conversation about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But if you're just looking at it from the local economic standpoint, certainly this is creating jobs and creating market opportunity. Uh, and from the balance of what I've read in looking at this from a climate change standpoint, it's probably a wash if you can wait long enough in terms of the carbon impact. So it's certainly better than some of the other resources that we know are clearly bad, uh, but it may not be as good as switching to solar or wind, for example. Um, these are just some of the feedstocks for biopower plants. I will dwell on that. Um, now, the other part of biomass is methane, and particularly from animal waste resources. And again, you can see there are a smaller number of hot spots around the country, and North Carolina is again one of those spots. So we are uh, fortunately so rich in poop, we don't know what to do with it all. <laughs> uh, so that is a wonderful thing in terms of energy generation if we can figure out how to get the systems right and the economics right. And that has really been the bugaboo on a lot of the methane projects to date. Uh, these are projects that for the most part haven't been replicable, and so it's been hard to get the economies of scale to drive prices down to the point where it's competitive with other resources. We do have a lot of folks working on that, some of them in the room tonight, so we're hoping to see a lot more uh, impact of the biomass, uh, in the biomass arena from animal waste. And I will note, Betsy will probably talk about this, but we're one of the few states that actually incentivizes 
energy production from animal waste as part of our renewable portfolio standard here in North Carolina. It's not the greatest incentive, but it's at least an incentive. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about wind, and I apologize about going so fast, but there's a lot of resources and little time here. Uh, wind energy is a topic that, you know, historically uh, was not a terribly big piece of the North Carolina mix, but that is starting to change. Uh, many of you may have heard about the recent announcement that Amazon uh, was partnering with a wind developer to build a large wind farm in northeastern North Carolina, up near the coast, uh, up in that area. Uh, that's going to be one of the largest wind facilities on the East Coast. Uh, it will certainly be the largest in the Southeast by a long shot. Uh, and it's uh, quite a, uh, a, a good start for our state. We do have significant wind energy resources that can be harnessed in different parts of the state, particularly in the coast and in the mountains. In the mountains, several years ago, the conversation was pretty much shut down by something called the Ridge, Ridgeline Protection Act, which is a state law that basically says Somebody built a big ugly condo on a ridge near the near the Blue Ridge Mountains, and we, we can see it, and we're mad about it, so we're going to pass a law that says you can't build anything else there. Again, kind of pick your poison. You can uh, defend the local viewscape and not worry as much about climate change or the other direction. It's a matter of what you like. Uh, that's one conversation in the state. Here at the coast, we're just starting to engage in this conversation, and there's a lot of people that are coming together to support wind energy, uh, and there's a lot of people that are not so happy about wind energy being developed at the coast because of, again, mostly view shed issues around coastal regions where there's a lot of tourism. Um, so that's something that will play out over time. Now, that said, um, the amount of wind that we can harness in North Carolina used to be very small, primarily here in the mountains, and if you made this map really big, you could see some dots here at the coast. As technology has improved and turbines have gotten taller and, and the wingspan of the blades has gotten wider, the map got a little bit better. And five to ten years from now, the technology is moving at such a rapid pace now that we expect to see vast parts of North Carolina that theoretically could actually support wind energy development. We'll have to see how that goes over time. But uh, right now, the future for wind energy in North Carolina actually looks pretty good. And then when you tackle on the offshore wind energy discussion, uh, it looks even better. We are home to one of the largest offshore wind resources in the country. In fact, uh, last time I checked, North Carolina's offshore wind resource was projected to be as large as most of the rest of the East Coast combined. And it has to do with the fact that North Carolina kind of sticks out a little closer to the jet stream, and that helps us, jet stream or Gulf stream, whichever one's the wind one. I always get them backwards. Uh, but we stick out a little bit further, and so uh, that gives us perhaps more resource, combined with the fact that we have very shallow waters coming off the coast, and so it's easier to build the turbines in the water because the water depths are not so great as they are up further north. So we are actually uh, a place where a lot of offshore wind energy could be developed. That said, again, this is a technology that's still a few years out. It's much more expensive than even conventional land-based wind, so we've got a ways to go to get those prices down. Right now, we don't have a single offshore wind project in the United States, but one's about to be built off of Block Island in Rhode Island. And once that happens, the expectation is we'll start to see prices come down for this. And then last but not least, on the resource side, solar energy. Solar is the easy one to talk about because we have lots of it everywhere. People sometimes say, oh, well, we got to live in Arizona to be able to do solar energy work. You know, this is Germany. You can kind of tell hot and cold on the map, right? So, Germany is the largest solar market in the world today, and it has roughly the same solar insulation as Alaska. So, when you look at North Carolina, we're actually looking pretty good. Uh, we have plenty of solar resource to do all kinds of solar here. And there are all kinds of solar to do, uh, which is one of the more interesting things about it. So, this is what we see a lot of in North Carolina, a large-scale solar farm in a rural area. Uh, but you can see solar on rooftops on residential homes. You can see solar used on billboards. You can see it on uh, telecommunications equipment. This is a water pumping station. Uh, this is an electric vehicle charging station. The beauty of solar, especially when we're talking about solar electric photovoltaics, is that it's a very modular technology. So whatever you need, whether it's your watch or it's you know, the house, you can kind of scale up with more of the technology. And that's really been the driving thing in, in uh, solar, and we'll probably hear more about this uh, in our next talk. We'll talk a little bit about how scale helps to drive down the cost in solar, but that's really what's driven North Carolina.
just real quick, this is kind of phases of a, a solar farm being developed. A lot of times I hear people concerned about farmland being taken out of circulation by solar farms. But when you look at what they do, these are just posts driven into the ground, and then some metal laid on top, and then the solar goes on top of that. When you're done with a solar farm, theoretically, sometime 30 years into the future, you pull the solar panels off, you take this off and recycle it, and then you pull the posts out of the ground, and then you're pretty much back to where you started. So solar is one of those technologies that has a lot of benefit because it's so easy to use in different places and that its impact on the land around it is very small. Historically, the knock on it has been the cost, primarily, and then there's also some grid management and intermittency issues that we have to take, out, take care of. We have folks in the room that are working on some of those grid management and intermittency issues. Uh, and there's a lot of technology folks around the country that are working on that piece of the puzzle. As the technology gets better and the smart grid technology gets better to manage the intermittency and batteries get better to help us at night, you're going to see more and more solar. And North Carolina is way out in front of a lot of the rest of the country right now with farms like this. This is the 20 megawatt system near Apple's data center in Maine, North Carolina. So these are solar installations around North Carolina. I think somebody else might have this slide as well. The little green dots are residential systems, and the orange dots, I think, are the solar farms. And somewhere in there, there's another color dot that's kind of commercial systems. But you can see that the nice thing about solar is that you can do it pretty much anywhere. And we get a lot of economic development benefit in the state from seeing it done in other places than just in big cities. This is a map that kind of tries to show the size of the solar markets by state. And you can see the biggest market in the, in the country is California. North Carolina is actually the second largest map, or second largest circle in this map, in 2014. So this is PV installations by state in 2014. There's a lot of different ways to slice this data, but North Carolina winds up in the top five in most of them these days. Uh, the colors here is what's interesting. The darker color represents residential scale, and the lighter color represents the utility scale, the solar farms. North Carolina is set up, policy-wise, today at least, to do solar farms. Doing residential scale and working on buildings is a lot more challenging from a policy perspective in the state right now. Uh, that's okay, we're doing okay with the big stuff. And all the stuff that we do on the big scale helps to drive down the price for everybody else. So in general, the trends are going the right direction, but we've still got a ways to go. And that's the resource extension. I hope I was close to 15. You are right on. Thank you very much. sector policy analysis and economic studies related to the energy sector, um, and then also in the last 10 years looking at um, greenhouse, ga greenhouse gas mitigation opportunities in the energy sector as well as the waste and many other uh, non-CO2 emitting uh, greenhouse gases uh, sectors. So that's a little background about me. Um, what I'm here to talk to you about tonight is the study that we conducted for the um, North Carolina uh, set, uh, Sustainable Energy Association. Um, and uh, recently completed in February um, to look at what the economic impacts have been of the renewable energy and energy efficiency portfolio standard that's been in place since 2007. So it was to really understand the state economic impacts that have, can be attributed to the uh, policy that's been in place for the last, at the time, seven years. So I, I will do my best to run through this. This is a very large study that's gone on recurringly for the last uh, three or four years, and um, I'm just trying to uh, kind of summarize very quickly. So uh, again, renewable energy portfolio standard been in place since 2007. Um, at the time, it was the first of its kind in the southeast, kind of very big landmark legislation to be achieved in North Carolina. Um, it requires electricity producers to provide some portion of their consumer energy demand through renewable energy resources and the reduction in consumer energy consumption through 
a variety of energy efficiency programs and techniques. Um, so RTI, in cooperation with our team member Scott Madden Consulting, which is an energy management consulting firm, um, worked together to do the, um, the, the current study um, to look at, again, kind of cover this, uh, the economic impacts and also the rate impacts that may be um, achievable over a 21 year time span as a result of maintaining the policy in its current status over that time period. Um, and I just wanted to say special thanks. They didn't get to come. I got to come to Wilmington. But uh, my colleagues, uh, Paul Quinlan, um, Zach Oliver, and Ryan Callahan, were princess, they were um, a huge part of making this report possible. And also thanks to Betsy for her review of multiple drafts of the report to get it to a place where we felt proud to put it out in front of people. So thanks to all of them. Um, so our study had two primary objectives. One was to look retrospectively at the economic impacts that had been, that um, we could track uh, over the last previous seven years, I guess, from 2007 to 2014. Um, understanding how changes in consumer spending, utility and government spending um, have impacted the local state economy. And, um, and then as a second objective, it was to look at the potential rate impacts. So this is, again, starting with historical Kind of installed capacity of renewable energy um, and building out some future pathway that it complies with the kind of ongoing incremental steps in the renewable energy portfolio to um, assess uh, what the um, incremental rate savings would be uh, or change in, in electricity rates would be between a conventional energy pathway and the what we currently have, which is this compliance with the portfolio standard energy development pathway. So I'm going to kind of summarize very quickly here the key findings overall of the two objectives, and then we'll go through the methodology. And if we have time, keep me honest about time. I'll try to just interrupt you at any time if you think I'm getting close. Um, so overall, um, we found three and a half, close to three and a half billion dollars worth of investment has been already spent in North Carolina developing clean energy. Um, the, and, and those investments continue to grow, or at least have historically continued to grow annually at an exponential rate. It's been, uh, it was pretty impressive when I came to me. Um, and from our own retrospective economic study, I think what we uncovered was that this has contributed to about a $4.2 billion impact or increase in the gross state product between over the last, over this cumulative time period of seven years. Um, and we've introduced new, uh, almost 45,000 new jobs. Uh, and these are full-time equivalent jobs, which is a term used to describe the, what would be the equivalent of a full-time position of um, Some of them may be seasonal workers, but overall, if you count out of the hours, it would be both 45,000. Um, and um, so then on the rate impact side, kind of perspective uh, analysis, Based on this 21 year time span and a comparison between a conventional portfolio of energy development and a, um, this compliance portfolio, uh, we found that there's this net present value of energy savings, that's, or cost savings is actually occurring. Um, a lot of that has to do with the energy efficiency component of our renewable energy standards, but also the cost of solar has been declining over time. There's been other um, kind of cost saving. Um, components that have been introduced. So that's where these savings are kind of derived from. And um, that's, so that's kind of the key findings of the report. So again, only having 15 minutes, keeping it very treetop level. Um, the methodology for the retrospective study was to accumulate all of the existing direct investment that has gone on over this time period for renewable energy and energy efficiency. Um, that will be our direct economic impacts associated with the energy standard. And then moving to calculate what the um, indirect effects or the secondary economic impacts would be, we use an in-plan model, which is an input-output model that tries to take um, an investment of some sort and then track how it has a ripple effect throughout the economy and other industries. And then as a result of having that output, we can then suggest what the total economy-wide impacts are, which include the direct impacts, which are the immediate investments that we're quantifying through our public data sources, and then um, these model-induced effects that we think are a reasonable um, estimate of the additional economic benefit associated with the policy, or costs. It could be a positive or a negative. 
So, huge effort to get all the data together, and thanks to NCCA for kind of helping us accumulate that information. Um, what we see in this graph is um, kind of the combined cumulative investment annually for renewable energy and energy efficiency. Um, and you see clearly kind of there's been this significant growth in the renewable energy area. And then associated with that is also the state level incentives that have been associated with the renewable energy portfolio standard to incentivize um, investment. Now I think what's interesting about this graph is the clear distinction between the level of incentives and the level of investment. That, that, the fact that it dwarfs it is a pretty significant and interesting finding in itself. Um, so looking kind of cumulatively across these seven years of investments, this is the distribution we see by renewable energy technology. Um, solar PV is the, uh, I guess the 800 pound renewable in the room, but uh, we clearly see some introduction of some other renewable energies, uh, landfill gas to energy, biomass, and these are somewhat, I would guess, um, this is an uninformed opinion, but I would say to me some of these um, other areas of uh, the balance of the portfolio standards. So um, not as much, almost zero win, but that may be changing as we heard from Steve and um, hopefully so. so but for now, this is what the world looks like today in North Carolina. Um, then, uh, this is just to kind of summarize the county level investments for renewable energy, so taking out energy efficiency, but and then also filtering it down to large scale, so million dollar projects are larger. And kind of the heat map shows the darker counties are those with greater investment, um, and the lighter counties are those with uh, less, less investment. I kind of did a quick focus on the counties of potential interest for the Cape Fear region, and just to cite, I mean, clearly Columbus is the largest of kind of the four that I think of as the key in the Cape Fear region area. <coughs> New Hanover has some investment, and then Brunswick and Pender have almost have zero investment, at least at this level, a million dollars above. Um, and then the adjacent counties have quite a bit of um, renewable energy investment, uh, Duplin almost twice as much as Columbus, so that's a pretty significant investment. And I think I did a check. Um, or I think, what do we have, uh, 3,500 3, million dollars in renewable energy investment. This is roughly 11% of the overall investment in the seven year period. Um, so 10% of the uh, state investment I think is pretty good for this small corner of the state. Um, and then there was just some additional savings associated with energy efficiency um, through the utility savings initiative and some other demand side management programs. I think I'll skip through this slide. So, retrospective analysis, overall state level economic impacts um, are as follows, kind of the total immediate output change, uh, positive change was the direct economic impact. The direct investment of the three and a half billion dollars, uh, the state level change in government spending, this is, so this is the incentives that they're paying out, minus a change in what they would have purchased in services from out of state. Um, and then this, these induced and indirect economic impacts, this is again these ripple through effects that are coming out of our in-plan modeling, are um, another $3 billion. So overall total output change is $6.3 billion. That contributed $4.1 billion to the state gross domestic product, um, gross, state domestic, uh, gross state product, sorry. Uh, and then our net change in employment as a result of this, these uh, policies have also been roughly 45 thousand employees. And then overall the fiscal impacts have been positive, which I think is interesting as well. The, this is associated with the additional revenue that's come in with these projects coming online, um, less the incentives. Um, okay, so then I'll try quickly, and this was just a distribution of the energy, uh, sorry, the, the economic impacts by energy efficiency and renewable energy, but moving ahead. So the rate impact analysis was we set up two scenarios. One was um, the compliance energy policy scenario where we have, we're building out our renewable energy to meet the renewable energy portfolio standard every year out to 2029 um, based on these reps requirements and then um, calculating and, and also developing a similar um, a similar conventional energy portfolio that would meet the projected increase in energy demand over the same time period um, at the least cost available um, energy generation technology, which today is natural gas, just given the natural gas prices. 
So that's what we have chosen to kind of model this, this conventional energy portfolio standard. So it is to calculate this 21 year time period, the cost of generating electricity, so this is building new energy generation uh, resources, um, operating those over their expected lifetime. It's all the immediate investment and then the ongoing recurring costs, less the cash flows and revenues that will be generated from the various um, energy generating resources. Um, taking the net present value of these two time series of scenarios and then taking the difference between them is what is giving us this compliance energy savings associated with the compliance scenario of the renewable energy uh, portfolio. And so, yeah, I've kind of already described, I think, the compliance portfolio versus the conventional portfolio. And then here's the, um, what this is, is the showing the renewable energy um, recs that we are requiring to purchase over time as we step out and kind of build up our, um, our requirements in terms of the energy generate, uh, renewable energy credits. Um, and you see we have some existing investment, which is this red line at the bottom, and then we move out and we buy out-of-state recs, which is the next least cost option to meet the portfolio standard. Um, and then there's some renewable capacity that's built in addition. It's just this blue area, and then finally the energy efficiency options on top. So, um, and then what we see with all of the existing investment that's gone on in the last seven years, we have this huge swath of resources that are generating credits that we don't even need to use to comply with the blue line, which is the energy, uh, renewable energy portfolio standard in each year. So these, these compliance, um, the RECs are carried over to the following years, and we have this oversupply, really, and we have more than enough to meet our needs with the amount of resources that we've invested. So, um, and I guess this slide was just to show you the technologies that we were including in our kind of in the both the conventional portfolio and then also the renewable energy portfolio and some of the data around it. But I think that this is more technical than we want to get into tonight. But I'm happy to answer questions if you have questions. Um, so for the compliance um, portfolio and the between the, the energy savings or the cost savings here is shown, shown by the difference between these two lines. So our red line is the conventional and our compliance portfolio is the blue line. And what we have is an overall net investment change. We start to see this divergence as we go out over time. Um, and then finally, on a kind of cents per kilowatt basis, what we're showing is a decline in the average cost of electricity as a result of that wedge being driven between the conventional and the uh, energy savings. And so, Again, this is to be taken with a grain of salt. This isn't to suggest that we're forecasting what your utility bill will be in 2029. It's merely to say that if we had continued down this path of conventional energy, it would have been more costly than if we have, if we continue, if we continue with the renewable energy portfolio standard and at renewable energy development. So, and that is the high speed <laughs> summary of, of what we've done. So, yeah. <laughs> Policy-wise, on 
how are we going to get to that clean energy economy? I think there's there's pretty widespread agreement um, that we we need to be moving towards cleaner technologies. Uh, those technologies are, are natural gas, they're nuclear, they're solar and wind, uh, biomass technologies. Um, but like I said, there's a lot of different ways to get there. And when you're working with the North Carolina General Assembly, you have 120 House members, you have uh, 50 senators, you have the executive branch, and every one of those people will have a, a different level of understanding about these technologies and maybe their own um, ideas about how we how we get there. So um, Jeff um, covered a lot of um, the arguments um, that we make as an advocacy organization in front of the General Assembly and in front of the, the governor and his staff. And, and really the takeaway here is that the, the clean energy economy is growing in North Carolina, but it's, it's coming at a savings uh, to ratepayers. So who are ratepayers? Well, I'm a ratepayer, you're a ratepayer, the company you work for is a ratepayer, the nonprofit you work for, the school that your children go to, they're ratepayers. Um, so no matter how you look at it, we're all um, kind of absorbing the cost and benefits of, of what happens on our electricity grid. I think a lot of us are just grateful. We get up in the morning, we flip our light switch, we unplug our iPhone, um, we run our hair dryer, whatever it is we do. Some of us unplug an electric vehicle, but you know, we go we go to our jobs without necessarily thinking about where did my electricity come from this morning? Is it cheaper today than it was yesterday? Is it cleaner than it was today than it was yesterday? Um, and so because we are so fortunate as, in this country to not necessarily have to think about, oh my, are the lights going to work today? We tend to take um, what's happening behind the switch um, for granted. And, and I think a lot of our policymakers um, do that as well. And so what tends to happen is that NCSEA and, and um, a lot of other uh, players in this space, we end up in this kind of soundbite game. And, and we end up kind of fighting over bumper stickers. And what I hear a lot of is, well, if solar and wind was so good, why wouldn't the free market support it? Why would you need a renewable energy and energy efficiency portfolio standard? Why would you need a renewable energy investment tax credit? These technologies should stand on their own. Steve can help me go into a relatively long discussion about energy subsidies across the board, but the kind of go-to point that, that I rely on is that in North Carolina, we are all subject to a regulated monopoly when it comes to electricity. We can talk about the benefits and the cost of that, but at the end of the day, when you move into a home, you're not provided with a list of, here are your electricity providers, pick the one that you like best. And so you don't have the option to go and see, oh, well, this electricity provider has a lot of wind in their portfolio. And I happen to like wind, so I'm, I'm willing to go with this company because I like what they have to offer. But you have that choice when you're trying to decide between cable and um, you know, internet TV or satellite TV, you get to kind of choose. Um, some people argue the cable companies have monopolies too, but in a way that, that industry is starting to deregulate. So, if we all kind of understand that we're in this monopoly situation, um, as much as we depend on free market forces in, in our daily lives, it just don't exist when it comes to electricity. So the argument of if you were good, you would be able to stand on your own kind of falls flat because if I'm a solar company or a wind company, I can't come to you and your business and say, would you like to buy some solar power from me today? It's just not legal. You have to go to your utility and get what's ever on their grid at that particular moment. Now, that grid is arguably getting cleaner um, but there's, there's this, always this kind of push and pull of um, special interest and of, um, you know, again, different paths that we can take to, to get to that, that cleaner place. So, monopoly. That's the big takeaway. That's what we're all kind of dealing with. Um, in response to that, North Carolina has a renewable energy and energy efficiency portfolio standard which Jeff and his team have looked at and have, have provided data that allows us to educate legislators. And this portfolio standard requires the utilities to either buy or produce 12.5% of their portfolio from renewables or efficiency by 2021. So it's kind of a mouthful. Um, but basically it's a stair-step approach to use less energy, that's the energy efficiency side, but to also incorporate some, some renewables in there. And the law doesn't go into a lot of detail about how those renewables have to be procured. 
There are a few set-asides. Um, some of the power does have to come from uh, swine waste. Some of it has to come from poultry waste. And some of it has to come from solar energy. Um, the set-aside that was for solar um, was, was very, very small. And the thought there was that the time solar was very, very expensive. And so they didn't carve out a specific piece. The, the fear was that it would all be gobbled up by another technology. At, at the time, they actually thought it would be wind and that solar really wouldn't have a chance. But the, the, the reverse has kind of happened and that we've seen solar take off and we haven't seen a lot of wind. So you may hear um, from our organization, you may hear from others about this portfolio standard. It's shortened to the REFs, Renewable Energy Portfolio Standard. Um, you'll also hear it called a mandate, uh, and it is. Uh, it is state law that utilities have to be in compliance with this mandate. But what we hear from some organizations is that this, this portfolio is driving up your costs. Um, this is driving industry from North Carolina in droves because they can't afford this expensive energy. And that kind of resonates with some people. They're like, well, yeah, it's solar and wind. I've heard that that's expensive, and if we're required to use it, then it makes sense that that would you know, drive up our energy prices. And that's why NCSEA went to RTI. Because if NCSEA just makes these arguments on our own, we're like, well, oh, you're an advocate, you know, you want to see more solar, so we can't really trust you. So we go to RTI, which I think everyone agrees is a, a reputable uh, economic institution, and, and they looked at it. And they said, this is the rate impact. And um, I wish Jeff would have left up that slide, the one at the end where he's showing the decline. Um, you, should, you should note that at the top of that is a zero. So what he's showing is a, a negative rate impact. It actually means there's downward pressure on your rates because of this law. So it's a little counterintuitive to what you would normally think, but to Jeff's point, a lot of that is because of the, the energy efficiency that's involved. So the cheapest electron is the one we don't have to create and that we don't have to consume. Uh, and there's a lot of that going on um, with the portfolio standard. So that is under attack. That is under attack at the General Assembly as we speak. It was under attack in 2013. There was a bill introduced um, to, to do away with it completely. Uh, kind of through the political process, the bill kind of got watered down, but it ended up not getting the votes it needed to, to pass either the House or the Senate, and, and the bill didn't make any progress in 2013. Uh, a, a similar bill, actually a much more aggressive bill, was filed this year, um, and through some, some interesting stakeholder engagement and other um, policies that were put on the table, um, a bill to freeze the portfolio standard at its current levels actually passed the House. Um, it had a little bit of movement in the Senate. Um, it's actually been sitting in the Senate Finance Committee uh, since May of this year, and we haven't seen that bill um, advance anymore. So our, our organization is very interested in keeping that bill where it is, uh, making sure that it does not pass um, in the Senate. One of the things that has been very eye-opening for a lot of the senators that obviously have to kind of grapple with whether or not this bill should move is the number of uh, North Carolina employers that have actually come out through direct lobbying but also in, in letters saying, do not change this standard. This standard is making us more competitive with our customers, or with our competitors. An example that was given, I was in a meeting with um, some of the staff in the governor's office. I don't know if you guys are familiar with BF Corporation, uh, the parent company for brands like Jansport, uh, Wrangler, um, a few others, Hames. Um, so basically, probably all have their products on tonight. You might be sent your kids to school with a Jan and Support backpack. Um, so they make, they make regulars. And Walmart is their biggest customer. Their biggest competitor is Levi's. And Levi's is based in San Francisco. They're based in Greensboro, in the triad area. And Walmart, their biggest customer, requires them to fill out a survey on how much renewable energy they procure. And, it's, and Walmart takes all this sustainability information into account when determining who their suppliers are. And so this woman from BF Corporation looked the governor's staff in the eye and said, you know, kind of in, environment is great, but this is not our customers. You know, if we can't sell to Walmart because California is more competitive than us, we've messed up. Because surely we have more business-friendly practices in North Carolina than we have in California, but yet our competitors in California are beating us out 
because we don't have enough access to renewable energy in North Carolina. And that was the first time I really heard it that clearly about how much of an economic development this development issue this is. I think DF has uh, 2,500 employees just in uh, the triad region. So there's a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of different ways to look at it, but what we're having to do is explain what is, um, what, what people tend to believe is that this is, this is expensive, this is going to drive up rates. And there's just not any evidence to support that. Um, so uh, the flip side of this is that um, the, the portfolio standard kind of got the market going. It kind of said, hey, we want these technologies to start to compete, the biomass, the solar, the wind, energy efficiency. Um, there's also in North Carolina something called a Renewable Energy Investment Tax Credit. And this speaks directly to private investment coming into the state. It really doesn't have anything to do with the utilities and how they operate. It has to do with you as investors, you as individuals. If you invest money in these technologies, you are eligible for an investment tax credit. So it's, it's 21 different technologies uh, qualify for this tax credit. Right now, the tax credit is set to expire at the end of this year. Um, we are very involved in efforts to see that be extended for an additional two years. Um, as you all know, the session is going on a little longer than, than most of us hoped, uh, but that is something that is still very much on the table and we're, we're advocating for the continuation of that tax credit. Uh, Jeff showed a heat map that showed investments uh, across one, all 100 counties, and that's largely driven by this renewable energy investment tax credit. So that tax credit has come at a cost of about $229 million to the state since 2007. So that's the, the credits that have actually been claimed. Um, but it's resulted in um, over $2.6 billion in investment. So $229 million investment from the state, $2.6 billion investment from the private sector. So I, I just want to make sure that everybody's clear when Jeff is talking about investment numbers, that is private sector investment, that is not government investment. Um, another key finding from the RTR report was that of that $2.6 billion, uh, two-thirds of it has gone into Tier 1 and Tier 2 counties. So many of you may have been involved in public policy discussions about how do we bring economic development to our rural counties, to our Tier 1 and Tier 2 counties. Do we do that through sales tax redistribution? Do we do that through um, you know, incentivizing certain technologies and, and areas? Do we do that with um, changing how um, JDIG monies from the state are appropriated? Um, we feel like a good way to do that is to incentivize renewable energy development because what we've seen by having a across the board incentive, the investments are, are trending towards those tier one. No one's telling them they have to go there. There's not an additional incentive to build in a tier one or tier two county. That's just how it's happening. Um, so we feel like that's another kind of arrow in the quiver to make sure that these these technol or these policies continue on. Um, however, the tax credit, because it is a it is a tax credit, it's involved in these tax reform discussions. So there are people in Raleigh that say any type of tax incentive um, distorts the market, um, it complicates things. We should go to a flatter, uh, a lower rate, and a and a broader base, and we should do away with with all the loopholes. Um, if any of you are kind of following what's happening in Raleigh, that's, that's been almost impossible to do. I mean, there were attempts in 2013 to actually do away with your home mortgage deduction. I mean, they were, they were really getting into the things that you depend on year after year. Um, but again, the flip side was that they were saying, well, if you lower your overall rate, you know, it should wash. And you guys know your personal finance is better than I do, but sometimes that's a difficult equation to balance. So I know it's late. And I won't go into any more boring, any more boring details on these two policies. What I'd really like to do and be a resource, I think Steve and Jeff agree, is that um, there's just let us be a resource to you. If you have questions about, you know, what happens to solar when a cloud comes over, or, or you know, why are we incentivizing this technology more than this technology, and why do we have so much nuclear when natural gas is so cheap? Just let us be a resource for you. And if we don't have the answer, uh, I bet one of the three of us could. Thank you. Well, thank you again.
to our panelists. We really appreciate it. You know, it's a, a long drop down, and that's some great information. I you know I'd like to do a retrospective impact analysis of my cell phone bill, college years, a lot of things <laughs> I didn't apologize about. But, uh, getting an update on the policy and all the resources is extremely helpful. I think I, I forgot to mention real quickly earlier to, to uh, just a quick thank you to our board for helping organize this, the Economic Development Council. I um, also want to recognize Rob Zappel. Um, we always appreciate you showing up to our events. Um, Rob's with the county commissioners, and, um, and so we appreciate it. But at this point in time, we'd like to uh, open it up for questions. I have a whole list of, um, <laughs> of my own that the uh, Koch brothers sent me and stuff. Very <laughs> hard right now. I'm not going to take up anyone's time with that. I'd like to um, hear what the audience has to say when we have some great experts here. So, could, please. I represent a lot of tier one counties. Um, um, we have, of course, Rob, New Hanover, and Brunswick, but we also do a lot of work in Blaine and Columbus. Um, we're bringing in Duplin and Sam from a lot of counties. And um, I met with the presidents of a lot of community colleges, and they're very interested in this, and they're coming to meet them. You know, we have kids, we want to train them. And um, a lot of the hesitation for companies to move into tier one counties is demographics. They don't want to bring their families in there, they don't have the school system, and so forth and so on. However, there are people there that are born and raised in those counties, and they want to stay there, and they're looking for jobs. So working with the community colleges, they're trying to design a curriculum that they will offer to their students, how do you do energy jobs? How do you do this? So the labor force is there and training on that level for these companies to come in and employ those local people. So that's something um, that we're looking at doing. And um, I'm not sure, you know, I'm just working on putting this together, but I think that uh, that combination of having a trained a workforce in it in Tier 1 counties, you know, it helps. And there are all kinds of incentives and perks. I mean, we do most of ours under USDA with federal funds, but Tier 1 counties, I mean, there's money there, and this is what they're trying to do. And I just wanted to, to you know, run that by, if you have any thoughts on that. I mean, I used to bobby in general Assembly, I don't anymore, but um, I'm not sure what the buzz is up there in regard to that. So I think that that message doesn't get through as often as it should. Yeah. I think um, policymakers care greatly about their community colleges. I think in a lot of communities, that's yeah. the lifeblood. That's where sure activities happen. That's where the training happens. If you if you want to change careers or get a new job, you better go down to the local community college. And I think it, you could argue that it's much more important in those areas than maybe in Wake and Burton. Also has yeah. community colleges. Um, so I think from a messaging point of view, if if state level policymakers understood the importance of clean energy to the community college in their backyard. Yeah starts to click, yeah. right? And so, especially in counties that maybe haven't seen as much renewable energy development. So the counties that are seeing the property tax base go up significantly, and those dollars are starting to come into the coffers, right. and, and county commissioners can say, wow, you know, we have more to work with now because there's a solar farm. They get it. Mm -hmm. um, but that money might not necessarily be getting through to whoever the, the state and, and the state rep and the state senator are, right? Because it's not flowing into their budget. Um, but if they heard from their local community college, right. you know, we just trained, you know, a class of 150 new, you know, new graduates that can now work on solar farms. Mm -hmm. Well, that legislator then has an incentive to make sure that solar farms are coming into that district to those 150 well, that's voters. Yeah, that's right. That's what we're doing in Duplin. You know, I just found this out. The largest solar farm east of the Mississippi is going to be built in Duplin. It is, and then right after that one's going to be built in Cumberland County, that's going to replace the one in Duplin County. That's right. That's good, right? That's what we right. want. We just want the counties sure. competing with each other, saying, "No, I have the biggest solar farm in the county." But what that really translates to is, I have most people working in solar in my district. My property tax base has gone up more than yours. That's what we want to create. Right? That's the competition that's going to that's going to propel us. So, so then I agree with you. It's educated because a lot of them don't know or they don't think about it, and you know that's just just as a quick side note. Um, this, the Clean Tech Center does training for community college instructors. So one of the things that we've done under the Department of Energy grant in the past is mm -hmm. train uh, tra uh, instructors that particularly work in the electrical trades and the plumbing trades. Mm -hmm. 
These are the people that are training electricians and plumbers of the future and trying to get them to incorporate solar technology in particular and some wind and some biofuels work as well into directly into their existing curriculum so that people aren't graduating necessarily as solar people. Right. They're graduating as electricians and plumbers that know how to do solar. The reality is that uh, we have a lot of kind of lower skill jobs in the solar farm world right now that are out there. And there's an increasing demand for them because we're seeing so much increasing demand as the number of solar farms increases. But the real future in solar is when we start getting more and more solar integrated into buildings. And that's electrical contracting work at that point. And that's a much higher skill and frankly a better paying job. And so where we want to see this go is we want to see, we want to see continued growth in solar farms because that gives us scale. And as I was alluding to earlier, Solar panels are just like cars. Henry Ford had it right. The more of them you build, the cheaper they get. Scale helps us a lot. But the best use of solar is to put it where the load is. A lot of these solar farms are not near a load. It's a good thing that they're out there because it's helping us drive this economy forward. But in the end, where we want to be is we want to put the solar panels where you're going to use the energy. Because you can. And you don't have losses associated with moving that electricity over lines for long distances and things of that nature. The closer to the load you get, frankly, the higher skill sets are required and the more electrical contracting and things of that nature are involved. So we work with a lot of community colleges across the state in trying to help drive these skill sets out into their existing curriculum. Um, I don't know if anybody here has been through some of our training courses, um, but we do a lot of our own training courses at, at NC State and we do them around the state as well. And we're more than happy to work with community colleges in the, in the counties down here to help try and drive that agenda forward. Thank you. Another question, sir? Yeah, well, it's more like an observation or a comment. My name is uh, Wayne Trusco, I'm just a citizen in the county. But um, it would seem to me that the community college presidents and board of directors could go to their local representatives and say, look, we want to train, but we also want to put those things on our roofs. We have this beautiful downtown community college that doesn't have one solar panel on it. And so they missed the boat downtown. You have the opportunity to put the bug in the ears. Presidents have clout. So therefore, I think, you know, we can start a nice little circular motion going on there. Well, I, thank, two, you. thank you. Two things I, I can say about that real quick. One is, while it is true that there is not as much solar on community colleges across the state as I would like, I would be remiss if I did not say that those community colleges should start by finding every piece of energy efficiency that they can and do that first. You know, energy efficiency both drives down the amount of solar that you need and it reduces the amount of waste that would come from any solar that you generate. So you always want to start with the energy efficiency investments. And the state actually does have some pretty good programs in that space that they've been working through, particularly something called the Utility Savings Initiative, which, you, which Jeff mentioned briefly, um, which is a, an initiative to try and improve energy efficiency in state buildings. So that's item one. Item two is once you've done that, uh, or maybe even before you've done that, if you're putting in the training program, that's an a really good time to try and put in a solar system for use in the training program. And there's a lot of grant sources out there where you can probably write towards that kind of goal. But it's funny you said that because there is grant money out there for, for schools, for students. So it could be a student project, actually, is to put a solar roof on your school, which I'm sure has been done before. Why don't you let somebody else do it for your students' students? Partner with the local business. Or someone from NC State. <laughs> or someone from NC State. But. Paul, you have a question? Yeah, uh, a couple months back prior to the tax incentive getting uh, extended in 2016, I heard someone make the argument that uh, you know, due to the rapid growth of utility scale solar throughout the state, it was able to in turn drive the cost down, so it's not needed anymore. Was it? That was their argument. So what would be your rebuttal to that argument? The rebuttal to that argument is want to ramp down the tax credit for these more mature technologies. So I mentioned that 21 technologies qualify for this tax credit. Um, Large-scale solar projects have um, seen the most success. Uh, solar in general has seen the most success. 80% of the tax credit has been directed at solar. And then the large-scale solar installations uh, have seen a, a disproportional amount of that. Um, so that technology, I would argue, is the most mature. And what they're saying is that Ramp us down. 
don't send us off a tax credit cliff because this is an important element of our um, of our financing. So what's been proposed in the House budget is a two-year grant down. And so the tax credit won't remain the same next year, and then it will go down to a 20% credit, and then it would disappear. And so what they're asking for is kind of policy certainty. Don't drive us off a cliff. Let us ramp down. The rest of the technologies, um, animal waste to energy, geothermal, combined heat power, wind, that haven't reached that scale, they, they don't have to contend with that argument, right? Because they haven't matured in the same way. And they're saying, you know, solar kind of gets all the attention. And so it's, in a lot of ways, it's driving some of that clean tech investment away from us and to them. Um, so if their credits kind of ramps down, that will give us an opportunity to kind of play in that space. So while it's great that the tax credit is simple because all, all 21 technologies can use it, there is some maturity going on in that space that may uh, merit a discussion about what different technologies actually need, different policies. The rooftop, or the rooftop solar, um, part of what's holding that back is the lack of third-party sales legislation in the state. And so there's, there's a bill introduced, House Bill 245, this session, that would allow the, the private sector to sell directly to um, customers, come to you, there's, there's a couple solar companies in the room, who come to you as a customer and sell solar power to you directly, um, which would help grow that market. But right now that's illegal in North Carolina. You have to go through your utility. So that's not a tax credit. Uh, but that is a policy mechanism that would make a tax credit um, less necessary. That's a minimum. I guess we're only one of four states that third um, party is. So North Carolina is only one of four states that explicitly prohibits third party sales of electricity. Um, and, and again, that's just the arrangement where you could work directly with another company to procure electricity. Um, you can, um, you can purchase a solar system and use it on site um, to offset your own load, but you have to um, have an arrangement with your utility to do that. So the solar companies in the room here will, will sell you the panels. They'll come and install them for you and, and do all the necessary work, but you own the panels. Um, where this third-party sales arrangement would allow them to own the panels and just sell you the electricity, similar to how you might um, have a copier in your office, uh, but you don't own the copier. You're paying for the copies uh, that your office uses. But to get a full understanding how that shaped the state out, just quickly to add, North Carolina is what, nine, probably 9% nine utility scale. I mean, we have maybe 3,000 right. homes. So there's also that utility scale, residential and non-residential, just thinking of businesses, a building like this, that's really, if you look at a state like Massachusetts where it's developed, so it's just an interesting dynamic. I'm sorry, ma'am, you had a question? I just have, this is an economic report, um, and I couldn't really see what the year was on the last four slides. There seemed to be a big ramp up with that, where the end of the um, reps comes to play, or is there was a change in reps at 2020 or 2021? That's the time period we elected to, to look at. Um, I think the 2021 is the year that um, you reach that 12 and a half percentage. Yeah. So right now we're at 6%. 6% right. of our energy has to come from renewables and efficiency. It then goes up to 10% in 2018, and then it goes up to 12 and a half percent in 2021, and then it holds steady there. Okay, you see that? I can't, couldn't tell what the year was, but it's like all of a sudden all the, all the rest of these graphs have these huge climbs. And I was trying to figure out what the driving force was for that. So that blue line is the steps in the, the, the okay. 12 percent that that's seems to mention. And so you're finally reaching it in this 20, let's say 2021 period. The last one was 2029. Okay. Right. So, so he's just modeling out additional eight years to show that, okay. you know, to give you a long enough study period to be able to assess the rate impact. So why in the previous slide that they showed, was there such a dramatic climb in whatever the so, in order to yeah, prove yeah. that you're complying with the law, um, you have to retire what are called renewable energy certificates. So that's essentially a we'll call it a piece of paper that says that you produce this much renewable energy, and so you have to retire that to be able to prove that you're doing it. And so these are the the, the recs, the certificates, those pieces of paper that are generated. Um, as part of, and it, it mirrors that stair step of, of the requirements under the law. Okay. It just seems something dramatic happens in yeah. that point. In, in 
2021, that's the last year. So basically the last step that's taken and the number of credits that has to be procured goes up dramatically. So that's what happens. Delay, you think? No, no, it's just because the requirement in the law is set up to increase in those key years, 2007, 2010, 2015, and 18 and 21. Okay. So that's that represents the last step in that ladder, and it just is a it looks big in this scale because it is big. Um, you know, a lot of this um, you know was pushed out further, and the steps were smaller earlier because it was assumed that the cost of compliance as the technology gets cheaper will be lower over time. Okay. Thank you. And the other thing that's important to know about the law is that a cost cap was written into the law, and so um, if you if you are um, Duke Energy or Progress Energy, or Duke Energy Progress customers, you actually have a line item on your bill that um, is a monthly rider that you pay uh, to comply with this law. And there, in the law, it was written that um, that amount couldn't go over a dollar a month or twelve dollars a year um, as as a as a savings mechanism uh, or as a protection mechanism for customers. Um, for residential that customers. for residential customers. It's a little higher for. Right, and and that um, amount that's allowed under to be recovered under the law does kind of go up with the stair steps, and I think it just increased in 2015, and now the maximum that, that the utilities can charge you on your bill every month is like two dollars and thirty cents. So it used to be a dollar, um, which they never they never hit that. The the large scale utilities never hit the dollar. Um, now they're allowed to cover recover as much as two dollars and thirty cents from you on your bill. They're not doing that, but they're allowed to if they can prove to the commission that it's needed. They can't just sit around and say, oh, well, we'll just raise everybody's bill $2 this month. If we can, they have to make a case for it in front of the commission. Is there any data in support of the difference between having third party sales and having only a monopoly that we have in one of the four states? Uh, do you have any data that will tell you? What the economic impact would be of having third party sales, uh, both the revenue and the acceptance of solar and other benefits? Only by comparing to what's happening in other states. That, that's where I would go. I mean, I'm not familiar. There may well be some economic studies that have looked at that specifically in the way you're suggesting. Um, I would check the websites of places like Lawrence Berkeley National Labs and the National Renewable Energy Lab. They do a lot of economic policy studies of that type. I'm not familiar with one off the top of my head, but usually the metric runs something like this. If you look out across the country at the big solar markets where third party sales are legal, uh, California, Northeast, places like that, Texas, you see this massive number of installations that's, driving, that's being uh, driven by residential and commercial installs. And you saw it in those circles that I showed in that chart. You know, in those states where it can happen, it does happen to a large extent if the market is growing in general. In a state like North Carolina, where you see less, it's actually less than 10% coming from commercial, from uh, commercial and residential installs. Almost all of it is coming from the utility scale installs. Utility scale installs are set up specifically to basically sell power to electric utilities. That's the way those projects are designed. The ability to use the solar on a building at, to serve local load is severely handicapped by the structure of the market as it currently is. So I don't have an exact number of what would be the economic um, you know, the gross state impact of such a change in law, but I can tell you that looking out across other states and having a relative sense of what the size of the markets are in those states, uh, it would seem to be logical that we would have a pretty strong impact from it. But, one, one way to maybe measure that is that in the northeastern corner of North Carolina, um, you do not have a monopoly situation. That is actually Dominion territory, um, which is part of the PJM interconnection grid. So it's not the monopoly that Duke has. And if you look at a map at where there's a strong concentration of renewable energy development, including this new wind farm, it's happening in that region of the state because they have access to the free market. They can contract with Amazon in Virginia and sell that power to Virginia. There's two large solar farms in that region of our state that are selling the power to two universities and a hospital in the District of Columbia. So they're building it in North Carolina, but it, the power is being exported 
um, to other states because they can take advantage of that free market wholesale dynamic that you can't take advantage of anywhere else in the state. So that and would be a good way to... Yeah, and that's just the wholesale market. That's not the retail level of the market, right. which is a whole different level of economic activity. But that's a, that's a very good analysis. Built my master's thesis was a case study comparison of North Carolina and Massachusetts, and it was basically what Steve just said. It was the it's the distribution. So who ends up having a residential and non-residential, and that's why we're I think predominantly uh, utility scale. So, Rob, yeah. Scott, first off, thank you, and the board directors of Cape Fear and our development council for bringing another terrific panel. This is really wonderful for the entire community. Uh, while we're on this slide presentation here, Jeff, I had a uh, Quick question for you. In one of your slides, I, I didn't quite understand that there's a dip in the electrical prices shown approximately in 2014, followed by a steep, you know, increase. It was, it was like a little you know, um, drop there. Maybe that was what was driving that forward. Uh, one more. Uh, sorry. No, the very yeah. last one. This. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's yeah I think that was it. Yeah, that's it. You, you see that that drop there in 2014. What was the cause of that, uh, and why did it go back up again? What, what was that all so, about? Sorry, no, I, I think what you're seeing there is again one of these um, period step ups in the in the state portfolio, and so there's some additional um, investment that's going to have to take place in order to get to compliance, and as a result, there's investment that then will cause the. the but, and what this is, Chris made a good point. This is a, a negative drop in the average price of electricity. Uh, so, right. starting at zero, we're going down 10 cent, uh, a cent, or 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, but then there's some required additional investment to meet the compliance of the portfolio. So, some additional costs incurred. And as a result, the on average kilowatt hour price. Goes up for it. And this is at Canada. This is on an annual basis, just showing it in a linear fashion. And it's all savings because all of that is happening below the zero below line. Below the zero line, right. Mm -hmm. uh, one other follow up question, Betsy, could you, could you expand a little bit on the uh, uh, Duke Energy's portion in all of this and uh, as a player in the state political party, whether they are supportive of this and what portions they are supportive and what portions they aren't? So the economic success story that we talked about, um, Duke is in no way blind to that. Um, they are seeing the benefits of investing in these technologies. Um, their customers are asking for it, but they're also seeing the, the benefits of having a cleaner um, and more diverse mix. So they are supportive of solar. Um, the devil's in the details. And so they are a regulated monopoly, and I talked about it in my presentation is kind of a, it's an, it's an advantage for them when you're talking about free market dynamics, but it's also a responsibility. And that as a regulated monopoly, they owe it to us to turn, turn you know, the lights on. And if we decide to build a cabin in the woods, they're responsible for running the line for us to have power as long as that cabin is in you know, their territory. A free market would say, eh, pay for your own line, and maybe it's not economical and you don't do it. So. They, they have an obligation. Um, so the devil's in the details, and, and they they play in the process um, to ensure that any policy changes don't disadvantage them. Um, and then they also have the the balancing act of ratepayers and shareholders. So what's in the best interest of a ratepayer may not always be in the best interest of a shareholder, and vice versa. Um, I think the coal ash conversation kind of illustrates that perfectly. Um, the, the rate payers are saying, well, a lot of rate payers are saying, well, we don't, we shouldn't have to pay the cost of, of cleaning up these, these coal ash ponds. The shareholders are saying, well, it shouldn't all go on us. And so, you know, there's going to be this balancing act. Obviously, the government will be involved, um, but they, they're constantly going through that process on things like solar. Um, their ability to recover costs associated with solar. Um, those policies don't mirror their ability to recover costs for things like large infrastructure like a nuclear plant. Those two things are regulated differently, and so it forces them to look at them differently. Um, po politically, I mean, I think they're the, the largest um, political action committee in the state. I mean, that's public information. You can look up, you know, how much they 
contribute to the campaigns of elected officials in the state, that type of um, contribution obviously comes with influence. So I mean, that's I, I think that goes without saying. Well, sometimes lost in the discussion, weren't they the largest, not to pick on people, the largest recipient of the investment tax? So, so in this past year of, of data that we have on the renewable energy investment tax credit, uh, Duke was responsible for $62 million of the tax credit claim, which is about half of the $124 million. Um, that's a little bit skewed because I don't think they claimed the credit for three years. Um, they, I don't I don't, account, I don't understand how that works, but uh, they were they were for projects over a three year life, uh, but they they claimed the credits all in one year. So you could argue that it's really twenty million dollars a year or three years or something like that. So it's a little distorted. But yes, in this past year, they were the largest claimer of the renewable energy investment. Interesting. And right. yet their position is neutral. Right, right, right. On the extension. Yes, sir. That's two questions. So um, more about solar. So. How close are we to kind of unsubsidized parity uh, between solar and kind of like coal or, or you know, natural gas? Well, it's a complicated question. You know, when you when you look at solar resources or you know, any of the other renewable resources, they've historically you know been dismissed as costing more. Right. The reality is, you know, as we said, the nice thing about renewable technologies, particularly the ones that don't use or use free fuel, wind or whatever it might be. The more you build, the cheaper they get. So all these things have been on a steady trajectory downward in price. And solar in particular in the last five to seven years had a breathtaking drop in price uh, into the, on the order of 80% uh, of the cost of solar panels uh, it, it was the decline. That was driven by a number of things. It was driven by overcapacity in the manufacturing side. Basically, Europe uh, and China tried to build more and then the economy um, went south and they wound up with a lot more capacity than they could effectively use initially. Uh, that drove the price of solar down, which turned out to be a real boon. It was one of the few sectors of the economy that continued to grow and everything else was in the tank a few years ago. Uh, so it was beneficial even though it wasn't so beneficial if you were a solar manufacturer. Um, you know, so what we see is steady downward pressure on these prices. Um, meanwhile, on the fossil side, in particular, we see steady upward pressure. You know, it's a combination of things. It's the fuel costs continue to climb, natural gas being maybe the exception to that conversation, but the environmental compliance costs are also starting to increase, and we're starting to see plants get shut down and replaced with new natural gas plants. While the operation of a, of a natural gas plant is pretty competitive, when you have to build new infrastructure, that's new capital costs that's getting introduced into the rate base and it's putting upward pressure on electricity prices. So a lot of this whole conversation right now is, which happens first? You know, does do solar and wind get cheap enough that they really start to put pressure on conventional resources in a way that you know the grid and the utilities have trouble competing themselves in the marketplace? A lot of that ties back to one factor: energy storage. Right. The biggest problem with trying to compare solar and wind to coal plants in terms of just straight up cost is intermittency. Solar is available when it's available, wind is available when it's available, and you gotta run a grid 24-7 because everybody expects the light switch to come. So that is challenging for utilities, and it's why we're not gonna see people going around shutting down nuclear plants or natural gas plants, coal plants, maybe so. But you know, a lot of the existing base that's out there is not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, that's okay, uh, because solar does continue to get cheaper and cheaper. So the real question is, if energy storage starts to get cheap and technically good, and I will say that right now energy storage is neither of those things, but it's improving. Um, but at some point, you start to see a point where those lines cross and people say, you know what, it's cheaper for me as a you know, wealthy company, and maybe Walmart decides that they're going to take all of their stores, and you know, we, why should we wait and see what electricity prices are going to be if I buy if I invest in this hardware, I'll know what my energy cost is for 20 years because I can finance it. I'll know exactly what the payment is. You know, let's take the mystery out of my, that part of my budget. Well, if Walmart does that and a bunch of other big box stores start doing that, you know, what happens? Well, that means there's fewer of us left on the grid to pay for what's there, the infrastructure that's got a 30-year lifespan that everybody was expecting us to be around to pay for. So that gets kind of scary. 
It gets even scarier when all the rich people go shopping. Well, maybe they don't go to Walmart. Maybe they go to Target. <laughs> but wherever they go, you know, they may say, well, if I see, you know, uh, you know, Walmart and Target doing this, why, why shouldn't I do this for my own house? They got one here in the back that they'll sell me. So then wealthy people start buying solar, and you don't have to be that wealthy to buy solar, especially these days, the prices have come down dramatically. But what you wind up with is a lot of people exiting the grid in this scenario because the equipment is there, the technology is there to let it happen. Mm -hmm. And the pricing is getting competitive. The more that that happens, the more you're left with who to pay for the grid? The poor. Mm -hmm. And if we get to that scenario, that's kind of like the worst case scenario for how this transition happens. Because what that means is we still need the grid. We still are going to need energy to be supplied for all kinds of sources to mix with the renewable resources that we have. And we're going to have a certain subset of people that are going to be economically excluded from that conversation. And so then you start having conversations about what do we do now? Do we, do we socialize the grid? Do we make a state-owned monopoly? How do we manage that process? So a lot of people feel that a better solution is that we reform the regulations that govern these electric utilities, these monopolies, and open the door for them to be able to invest in these technologies more effectively because in a lot of ways, utilities are our friends. I mean, you gotta admit, we're the most electrified country on the planet, and we have a standard of living rivaled by none, and it's largely because of access to electricity. And so throwing away all of that 200 years of work that we've done in the electric utility sector doesn't make a whole hell of a lot of sense. So finding a way to you know, create an opportunity for the utilities to benefit from this technology as it proliferates, and have them be the investors in it. Now, you don't have to necessarily keep them at monopoly levels. There's other places to go. I mean, it's kind of the, the, analog, the analog is the telecom industry. We used to have Ma Bell. You know, now there's AT&T is kind of the antecedent of Ma Bell. It's one of several players in the cell phone industry. Verizon traces its roots back as well. But, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are not part of that original monopoly. But some of the pieces of the original monopoly were saved. And some of the infrastructure and some of the good works that they did were saved as well. And so now we've got, uh, some, I just paid my bill, so it's not the most competitive market, which is more competitive, but at least it's a start. And you've got these different players that are out there, and we've kept the incumbents in the game without having them go bankrupt and create all kinds of chaos. And if it would have been chaos in telecom, it would be twice as much, if not more, chaos in the electric utility sector if that were to happen. So I didn't really answer your question. I kind of dodged it. But I gave you a little bit of a sense of... You know, a little bit of a sense of the, of the dynamics of how it works. No, I think that was helpful. And then, so a quick follow-up thing, because it kind of led into the, my other question was around Elon Musk and the, uh, the Powerwall and the Tesla battery sure. and all that type of thing. So is that kind of bluster? Is that kind of a reality that will balance the storage, you know, and the fluctuation problem you mentioned before? You, you, you probably have to ask Elon whether it's bluster. <laughs> but, you know, I, I will say this. The technology's come I think everybody agrees that the genie is out of the bottle on the technology front. It's just a matter of time. And so really, this, this is all just kind of a foot race right now. There's forces that want to see electric utilities, you know, they've been the bane of our existence for, you know, X amount of years, and they deserve to go where they're going. There's others that say electric utilities, you know, my father's father, you know, wouldn't have had a job if it wasn't for this, and we got to figure out how to save that. You know, guys like Elon, you know, I think Elon would be perfectly happy to, to dance while the world burns around him as long as he's making a good buck at it. And, you know, I think that his technology and the work that they're doing is designed to move things that way. Um, you know, there's a lot of other people. Uh, what's our battery company down in Thank you. Thank you. Lego. Lego's making large-scale batteries to work with the utility sector to be able to let them do the exact same kinds of things that Elon wants to let you do. You know, that's, that's the dynamic now. The competition really is between the big guys and the little guys. And it's just a matter of whether the big guys can be nimble enough to stay in the game and be like AT&T and Verizon, or whether they're going to fall on their face like Blockbuster Video when Netflix came out. I you think so. Uh, I don't mind your criticizing Elon Musk, but I think you've got it upside down. The principal buyers of this technology for battery storage right now of the utilities. That's a fair point. It's not where he wants to be. They're really well, I think that he's fine with so many utilities. He, he's, 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 he's fine with selling anything. He's driving electricity as a substitute 
from where we are today. That's right. And that includes the storage. But he's looking at Solar City, which is another one of his companies that mm -hmm. focuses on the residential market. And he wants to start putting those pieces together in a way that really changes the game fundamentally. I don't disagree with you. Can I have one comment that this is as we bring it back to North Carolina, jobs, revenue. And it's based on a comment you have made to me that I think is really interesting as we talk about battery storage. As we go to the next evolution, and it is a foot race we see in South Carolina, Carolina and Georgia anticipating this. Is there going to, if we put the brakes on the incentives, the reps bill, and there's a vacuum, mass exodus, not a mass exodus, but this exodus, and it moves to the other states, is there a fear if you want to comment on those jobs of that next evolution in smart grid, battery storage, things that are around universities, as you think about in Raleigh and Durham area or here, that going to different states where they're going to be. And so is that a concern or just a, it was a very enlightening point that you made to me that I think it's worth mentioning. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it is a fair point. One of the big economic development arguments, and this is one of the two you alluded to this, I don't know if remember, is, and it's best with the VF conversation. You know, if we undo these incentives that have made us look like a state that supports new technology and new technology growth, if we undo that, the technology companies are going to look at us and say, why would I go there when I can go to Silicon Valley or Austin, Texas or Boston, Massachusetts or other places that are similar to us and compete with us? The Research Triangle area in particular but you know, we have the largest concentration of smart grid companies uh, on the East Coast, and one of the, I think it's the second largest in the country behind San Diego. Huge number of companies working in this space. And because of that, we have companies all over the state that are working with them, either as component suppliers or as research shops, you know, there are even individuals that have spun out of these universities and they're starting up their own companies. It's a huge economic driver for the state. If we undo these incentives, we make the state less attractive as a market for their product, they'll leave. And that will affect everybody from Centennial uh, Campus at NC State to Cape Fear Community College, where they're doing really good stuff in fuel cells and wind energy. You know, I mean, everybody's got a piece of this in this state. We even have a big piece of the conventional energy picture. Here. There's a huge number of conventional energy companies down in the Charlotte area. So the North, North Carolina economy is this unbelievably balanced energy juggernaut. There's no other state with the possible exception of Texas that looks like us when you bring all of energy together in the conversation. And so why we're focused on one piece of that puzzle and trying to exterminate it from a policy standpoint right now, I'm a little mystified. Because, you know, it's not like renewables are the only technology in the, in the game that is getting incentivized out the, out the wazoo. Everything in energy is subsequent, whether it's the Price-Anderson Act that makes nuclear power more affordable by giving them a pass on insurance risk, or it's, you know, the fact that we used eminent domain in the government, the government used eminent domain to lay railroad tracks around the United States so we could coal back and forth. You know, there's all kinds of incentives that have been embedded in the energy system for hundreds of years, and to think that we're going to undo the tax credits for renewables to restore balance is just ludicrous. I know we're at time, but one, um, uh, do we have one more question? I think so. Very good. Yes, ma'am? I was just curious, what, what is, uh, where do we stand with the current legislature regarding those tax credits? Are, do we have a plan for, are they going to continue with it in 2016, or is it, are we at risk of losing them? I don't know that there's an answer for that just yet. Definitely um, a risk. It's definitely a risk. Definitely. Um, I haven't put our eyes at any better than 50-50 uh, during this whole you know, campaign to extend the credit. Um, again, just kind of the, the animosity we deal with just on tax credits in general. Um, and then there are some very, very, very loud and well-funded voices that are reinforcing this argument that this technology is expensive, it's not reliable, and therefore you, the customer, will pay the price if these technologies are allowed to continue growing. So we we are combating that, um, while also trying to get the, the good information that just organization put together into the hands of the people that need it. But it's, it's a very, very loud megaphone working against us. And um, one thing that I would encourage you to do is to please, please, please reach out to your legislator. If this is something that's important to you, um, and, and even if you want some additional information to relay to them, please contact our organization, because what I have found is that five or six voices in a community 
can mean everything to a legislator. If they're hearing from five or six key people, if you're a business owner, if you're a teacher, if you work at a community college, I mean, if, if you are connected to your community, they care about what you have to say. Especially if you can deliver the message to them as being important to the community, not necessarily a, hey, I want a tax credit for the solar panels on my house. But if you can make the argument to them about the contribution this is making to the, to the economic development potential of your region, they will be all ears. I mean, with very few exceptions. So please don't underestimate your power. Um, this is state level government. These, these legislators have to come back to you every two years and ask for your vote. They're, they are listening. Um, nothing, a lobbyist means nothing when compared to a constituent. So please reach out. It makes a huge difference. And we did it like all of them. Let's see. But Rob was kind enough to show up. with saying the governor had a Just one last thing while we're doing some commercials. The other thing I would, I would mention here is. Everybody in this room, if you were interested enough to come to this talk, you really ought to be a member of Betsy's organization, the North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association. Individual membership is ridiculously cheap, and you'll get on a newsletter where you actually find out what's going on on a regular basis so that you know what to talk to your legislators and your elected officials about. Uh, if, you're a, if you're a company and you want to join, they take company memberships as well, and those help to support some of the uh, advocacy efforts of the organization. I would say that I'm a board member, Randall in the back here is a board member. Uh, we're happy Gus to talk to you. Is oh, Gus is a board member, that's right. Oh, Sorry. So, so we got three board members of NCSEA here tonight, and we'd be happy to chat with anybody who got that organization as well. I work for NC State, we don't take members, but if you're talking to your legislature, <laughs> put a good word in for us too. That would be great. <laughs> well, I think we're at time. Uh, again, thanks everyone for attending.